Representative uh, Stevens, thank you for coming today. <laughs> Thanks for having me. We're on the record, Ron? We are on the record, sir. Thank you. Representative Stevens, take it away. Um, thank you. Um, this is H-492, and this is short, short title would be um, a homelessness bill of rights. This was a homeless bill of rights. This is uh, something that we considered two years ago that would essentially put together um, a basic bill of rights for homeless people and prohibit discrimination against people without homes. We have heard uh, specifically about some very difficult times for homeless folks in, in Chittenden County, in Burlington in particular, but we know that this happens uh, in the Upper Valley. We know that, and what happens? It's the stigma of being homeless. And so, uh, and, and what that means uh, all the way up and down that, that life that, that, they are, that they are living. And so the first portion of this bill is simply findings, and I'm gonna let the walkthrough go to the attorney who's here um, to get into the specific things. But this, this is something that has fit in with our, uh, the goals of our legislation over the years to try to provide more housing for homeless individuals, people suffering through homelessness. Um, we have been given the privilege to really um, stand with people on the front steps of the, of, the, of the building when we've had Homelessness Awareness Day. We have had the privilege of hearing testimony from folks who are formerly homeless who have related their stories of, of lived experience that inspired things that we, unless you've lived that experience, it's very hard to understand and so what happens when you don't understand is that you try to at least provide protection in the law um, or give or let people know that they're seen in the law and this is just one uh, bill that fits into that category for me so um, I, I think you all know again how passionately I feel about housing in particular we know that we don't do enough that it's, we're possible of doing more than what we do uh, and that's an endless battle. But in this particular case, we have to take people where they are, and we have to try to do what we can do in creating a statement of, of um, just a statement of purpose that says that people who are, who are going through homelessness deserve the right to be heard and the right not to be abused by the people who have more power than they do. So with that, um, I will slide this way and let the, um, the attorney Martin take over from there with a the walkthrough. Thank you. Question, questions or should we wait till later? <laughs> well, Thank you. Everybody. We'll hold questions for you. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Luke Marlin, the Director of Legislative Council and Chief Counsel of the General Assembly. And I'm here today to do a walk through the bill. This is the as introduced version from 2019. As Representative Stevens referenced, uh, this matter was taken up in a prior biennium. Um, but there were different versions at this time. We're only looking at the as introduced version from 2019. And what I'll do is walk through the bill. As always, please stop me and ask a question if anything I say is unclear. But I will not be reading the bill to you. I'll try to highlight sections. And at other times, I'll just summarize or skip over. But if there's anything that's unclear, if you want me to go back and cover, please just let me know. <coughs> so the bill has three main sections. Number one is a finding section. Number two is what is entitled the Homeless Bill of Rights. And then number three are various changes to existing non-discrimination statutes. I would like to take them in a slightly different order where I very quickly look at the findings, I'm not gonna read them, but just go over them, and then jump to the existing non-discrimination statutes, and then last of all, go back and look at the Homeless Bill of Rights law. So starting with the findings section, which is, do all you have this on your uh, iPads or your <laughs> So. Findings start on page one and continue on to page two. I do not intend to read these. Are there any questions about these? As you know, these are a summary of what the General Assembly believes, the rationale for the bill, but it has little or no legal weight. But it's an expression of your point of view and why you think this bill is important. 
And as it appears, just as, just as a reminder, if this bill were to become law, this material might be found in the white books, but not in the green books? That, that is correct. This would be what we call session law, which is in the white books. And it is law, so it's of equal weight. It's just it doesn't specifically tell any party to do or not do anything. It's more of an expression of your rationale for any bill that you attach bondings to. Um, oh, may I? Okay. Just the, uh, as a result of economic hardship and shortage of safe and affordable housing. But what, I mean, it's so complex with substance use issues and mental illness. And it, is that not factored in? Or well, this is this a pretty a narrow to the definition of? Finding, I guess. Well, I think the findings is what the sponsor of a bill or the committee, if it passes out of a bill, decides to include. Okay. It could be short, it could be long. I really leave that up to you. It's expressing your policy point of view. Right. So what you include is okay. up to you. Okay. Thanks. As I indicated earlier, I'd like now to jump to the amendments to existing non-discrimination law. So this would be going to section three, which is on page four. So as background, Title IX and Chapter 139 uh, concerns discrimination, for example, public accommodations. The next three sections of this bill, three that we're looking at right now, four and five, which amend 9 VSA 4501, 4502, and 4503 are all part of that same chapter. So when we start with 4501, we're adding in a new definition of housing status. And you'll see the same definition repeated in other titles later on. Because this applies to the whole chapter, it's not only this definitional section that we're amending, but also it applies to section four and section five that we'll get to in a moment. And, so this, and this is a new definition in statute or a new definition for these sections? It's in statute. It applies to this chapter of Title IX, which includes public accommodations and unfair housing practices that we'll get to in a moment. You'll see in subsequent sections there's an identical definition that applies to other non-discrimination statutes and other titles. And what all these things do is they add a new protected class to various anti-discrimination laws. So right now in various anti-discrimination laws you have race, religion, national or origin, um, sexual orientation, gender identity, etc. You have these various protected classes or protected categories under specific anti-discrimination statutes <coughs> in Vermont law. What this bill does is to some of those anti-discrimination statutes, it adds in a new protected class of housing status. So let's look at the definition of housing status. Now, if you say 4501, it's on page 4 at the bottom, line 16. Housing status means the status of being homeless, being a homeless individual, or being a homeless person as defined in, and there's a cross-reference to a federal law. Now, as an aside, this is 11. If this bill go forward, it would have to be renumbered as 12, because in 2019, this same section of law was already amended and it now is 11. So looking at 42 BSA, 11302. I want to read you this definition of homeless, or I should say housing status, because this will then be repeated in the later sections of the bill. For purposes of this chapter, the term homeless, homeless individual, and homeless person means an individual or family who lacks a fixed, regular, and adequate nighttime residence, an individual or family with a primary nighttime residence that is a public or private place not designed for or ordinarily used as a regular sleeping accommodation for human beings, including a car, park, abandoned building, bus or train station, et cetera. Three, an individual or family living in a supervised, publicly or privately operated shelter designed to provide temporary residence. Four, an individual who resides in a shelter or a place not meant for human habitation and who's existing, I'm sorry, exiting an institution where he or she was temporarily, temporarily resided. 
and then under five, an individual or family who will imminently lose their housing, including housing they own, rent, or live in, et cetera. So what this does, this is a federal definition, there's more to it, but I think you now have a gist of it. By adding number 11, which would be number 12, housing status in this section of the law, it pulls in that federal definition, those criteria I just went through. And once again, this same language will be repeated again and again. Now, I would point out that there is a definition, or our definitions, of homelessness in various Vermont laws that are not as uh, lengthy or as detailed as the federal definition I just read to you. For example, in Title 16, which concerns education, 1075, there's a definition of a child of homeless parents, and then there's a definition of what a homeless parent is, including lacking a fixed, regular, and adequate residence, or having a primary nighttime residence in a supervised, publicly or privately operated shelter or temporary accommodation, et cetera. So it includes some of the same themes, some even the same phrasing, but it's not as long or as detailed as a federal definition. Are there any questions about that federal definition before I go forward? Now the state, this bill pulls it within a new state definition. Any questions? Representative Collette. I visited um, South Burlington, a, a old hotel's rehab, and it was, it's now have housing for, I think, 20 people who have been chronically homeless, and it's pretty amazing. But one of the uh, residents I spoke to said he had lived in a tent mm -hmm. along the railroad tracks for five years. Okay. And because it was, um, the city couldn't, uh, <coughs> because it was on, I guess, federal land because it was the railroad. And he said there's a whole group of people that have lived there quite successfully. Mm -hmm. And so it seems to me, would, would they be considered homeless in these definitions if they live for years in a community in a tent? <coughs> are, are they not I, housed? I believe they would fall within that federal definition that I read to you. That they would? Yes, I believe so. And then they would also therefore be fall within the new state definition of that term. I okay. believe so. Yes. Thank you. And then that state definition would, that definition would apply simply to these chapters. It wouldn't necessarily cross over to the education. Um, no, so it applies, good question, it applies right now to Title IX in this chapter of Title IX. And when I talk about public accommodation and unfair housing practices, you'll see what it impacts. Then later in the bill, there's other different uh, titles where it also applies. But it doesn't apply to all Vermont law. It's only to the chapter or the title that it's put within. Right. So this is, I mean, we've, we've had explanations where there's a, there's a dozen different definitions of employer or employee that apply simply to those sections. So this, yes. is, this is like that. Except we, we don't often, well, I, this committee doesn't often pull in federal law yeah. as its base definition. Yes. That is a little unusual. And um, you're right, sometimes there's terms that are defined very differently in different titles. I think you'll see for this bill, it's the same words in every title. That is impacted. And then in terms of what's going to come forward in each of these separate sections where these the anti-discrimination language are becoming protected status, I mean, that's just... Yes, that's really repeating the term. So let's continue, and I think you'll see how it shakes out. So we once again, we're in Title IX. So let's now look at Section 4, which is on page 5. So this is Title IX, uh, 9 VSA 4502. This is anti-discrimination law pertaining to public accommodation. Let me read you the definition of public accommodation, which is defined in a separate statute. Uh, public accommodation means any school, restaurant, store, establishment, or other facility at which services, facilities, goods, privileges, advantages, benefits, or accommodations are offered to the general public. So it's a broad definition. 4502 says that an owner or operator of a place of public accommodation or an agent or employee, et cetera, shall not because of, and then it lists various categories that you cannot discriminate on the basis of. And what this bill does on line five is add housing status to that list. So if this bill becomes law, as to public accommodation, you cannot discriminate on that basis. Section five, which is 9 VSA 4503, same chapter, same title, is now referring to unfair housing practices. And I'll summarize, I won't read this for you because this section continues for the next 
two pages, but what it does is list various uh, situations in which uh, you cannot discriminate to people. And each of those paragraphs it now adds housing status as one of those protected categories. For example, under A, it states it shall be unlawful for a person to, number one, refuse to sell or rent or refuse to negotiate for the sale or rental of or otherwise make unavailable or deny a dwelling or other real estate to any person because of, and then there's a list of protected categories, you'll see on line 16, housing status is now added to that list. On the bottom of page five, continuing on page six, there's various situations that, once again, you cannot discriminate on the basis of the protected categories, and for each of those, housing status is now added in. Is that clear? Okay. If you proceed to page eight, we're now in section six. So we've dealt with title nine. Now we're jumping to title 10. And this section of law pertains to Vermont Housing Finance Authority. If you look at the bottom of page eight, you'll see housing status is defined just as we looked at earlier. Same words, same definition. And what happens in the middle of the page under 11 is it, it basically what this does, it says that the Vermont Housing Finance Authority in carrying out its normal duties, which are not changed by this bill, cannot discriminate on the basis of housing status. Section seven, on the top of page nine, now we're jumping to title 21. So we're jumping to a different title, a different anti-discrimination statute. Title 21, as you well know, deals with labor and employment. And we're in a chapter and a subchapter dealing with unlawful employment practices. And I think you're familiar with this, these statutes. What this does in 21 VSA 495, in the list of unlawful employment practices, it includes housing status. The definition of housing status is actually the subsequent section it's on page 10, it's in 21 VSA 495D, that's just the way the title's organized. But it's the same definition, it's later in the bill, later in the title, but it refers to what we're looking at right now on page 10. So what these amendments to 21 VSA 495 will do is once again make it illegal for, um, to make it illegal employment practice, discriminate on the basis of housing status. Housing status is the same definition we looked at earlier. Is that clear to everyone? I want to go back now and look at the Homeless Bill of Rights section, the second part of this bill. But is that clear to everyone? Could I ask clarification on public accommodations? Yes. So the restaurants on Church Street in Burlington, um, this means that they could not tell someone they're not welcome to come into the restaurant. That is accurate. If they're homeless. That's right, they were homeless. That's accurate. Right. That's accurate. Okay. Got it. Yep. If, now, it if mean, they were coming in to do the business of the restaurant, right? I mean, this is the, this is the fine line with discrimination that I've always been told. It's that we still discriminate against people. In fact, we just heard the recovery residence bill where we may create an exemption to these discrimination laws in order to make readily covered residences work. But this is, each of those protected statuses are for the individual things that we're protecting against, right? And, and, in, in the sense that in a public place, it is about the business that they're doing. They could tell them not to come in if they can't pay the bill. They can come in and say, so you can't come in. If there's other reasons why they might ask you to leave, but they cannot simply ask you to leave because they're homeless, yeah. is the way I understand that. Is that? That is accurate. Got it. Yeah. Thanks. Going down to section two, which starts on page two. So this is the section it would create a new section of law entitled one, which is sort of the general provisions. 
Title I, VSA 274, entitled the Homeless Bill of Rights. <coughs> I once again, I won't read it word for word, but because this is more new law, I'll go through it and try to summarize it for you. If there's anything unclear, please let me know and stop me. So it begins by, under subsection A, stating that a person's rights, privileges, or access to public services may not be denied or abridged solely because he or she is without housing or because of housing status. Such a person shall be granted the same rights and privileges as any other resident of the state. So that's a general statement, general law. Under B, this gets more specific. A person without housing shall have the right, number one, to use and move freely in public spaces, including sidewalks, parks, transportation, etc. Number two, to equal treatment by all state and municipal agencies without discrimination. Three, not to face discrimination while seeking or maintaining employment, including on the basis of lacking a permanent address. On page three, <clears throat> number four, to emergency medical care free from discrimination based on housing status. Five, to vote, register to vote, and receive documentation necessary to prove identity for voting without discrimination. Six, to confidentiality of personal records and information in accordance with various laws. Seven, to a reasonable expectation of privacy in personal property. Eight, to immediate and continued enrollment of school-aged children. And then if you proceed to page four, subsection C states that no person shall be subject to civil or criminal sanctions for soliciting, sharing, accepting, or offering food, water, money, or other donations in public places. D, no law shall target persons without housing for the harmless activities associated with homelessness or the provision of supports or services to persons without housing or perceived to be without housing in traditional public fora. Traditional public fora is public spaces, parks, et cetera. It's a term that's defined in litigation, but if you think of it as a public space, a sidewalk, et cetera. E, a person aggrieved by a violation of this section. So everything that I paraphrased for you under section two may bring an action in Superior Court for appropriate relief, including injunctive relief and actual damages sustained as a result of the violation, costs, and reasonable attorney's fees. So it gives a right of action if your rights have been violated. Represent something. So the wording there is different from perceived to be without housing. Previously, that the, I guess the distinction I was trying to understand was like with, in the case of public accommodations, in the other section it says you can't you can't discriminate on the basis of housing status. Correct. But it doesn't say that you can't discriminate on the basis of the perception of housing status. In other words, does the law make that distinction between this is someone who is disheveled, and I made the I made the distinction based on that, not on whether or not I had any concern whether they had a home or not. So you are right that this phrasing is different because it says proceed. You're actually right. Good point. And if there was an actual case involving this, and this is, I think you can ask other witnesses also about this, but there's an actual litigation concerning discrimination on the basis of housing status or homelessness, you know, where that line is, whether why you thought they were homeless, whether it's accurate or not, might be very fact specific. So I can't really give you a, a hard and fast answer. But you are right that this part of the bill as in proceed. That's a phrasing not present in the rest of the bill. So I mean, again, I guess taking the, the South Burlington or the Burlington example, if I was a particularly cagey restaurant owner, I could say I asked them to leave because they, they were disheveled. I, I had no concern whether they had a home or not. That, so they, so yeah. that would okay. be that's the case in yep. court, fact specific. And that's probably better for some other witnesses to, to ask them. But yes, you can always try to defeat the cause of action by claiming you weren't acting on a certain basis. Whether it works or not, another issue. The perceived language just seems so much stronger because then it could, that it could covers speak more with it. Yes, yeah. I think you're right. <clears throat> Representative Blackie, on um, page two, yep. uh, 
the section um, to use and move freely in public spaces, including public sidewalks, parks, transportation, that, that line 13 through 15. Mm -hmm. um, in Burlington, I often see the police come in in the city hall park and ask people to keep moving mm -hmm. and not congregate in the park or not sleep in the park. Um, so, and then when people set up tent, tent communities in different places, they are then raised. And so, this is used and move freely. This is allow people to congregate and be somewhere and stand. I think it very well might. I think it might either prevent or make it very difficult to have the police tell someone to move on. Um, and of course, there's under CD, there's language that a person cannot be subject to civil or criminal sanctions for soliciting or accepting certain things in public space, and no law shall target persons um, associated for engaging in activities associated with homelessness or supports, um, et cetera. So that might apply too. But I think all this language as a whole might make it uh, unlikely to please order someone to move on or, or certainly bar any law that prevents people from soliciting in the public space. I, um, I ran the Food Center in Burlington uh, for eight years and it's a 1400 seat theater. Mm -hmm. And often at night people would sleep on the marquee, mm -hmm. which is fine to be protected. But then when we were opening for business um, and the school kids were coming in, I would have to ask the people who had slept there for the night to, to move so they would have kids come in. It was a, an access issue because we, you know, had a thousand kids come in school buses. And um, so for business owners, is, is that all right then to ask people to move? So in this, I don't know if the law prohibits someone from asking someone to move. Right. It may prohibit follow-up actions, especially by law enforcement authority. Okay. I think these are good questions, but they're very fact-specific. Yeah. And so it's hard to give a black and white answer because it might depend on a whole bunch of circumstances. So it's a good question, but I don't know if I can say definitely you can do this or definitely you can't do that. I think it might be very fact-specific. I think this would make it, this would limit the ability of business owners to tell someone to move on. Yes, I can see that. I cannot say 100% definite that they could never do it or it would never be lawful. I don't think anyone could. Everything is fact specific. But yes, this would limit the ability of business owners to tell someone to move along if they're in the sidewalk outside their shop. I can see that. And then, of course, if the community wants to try to define circumstances more narrowly, Perhaps well, this, could, sort of, so. this, this sort of goes to the um, the line of you know where do where do my rights begin and where do, you know where do mm -hmm. your rights begin and mine stop etc cetera, etc cetera. almost and stopped. and it's an understanding as well of what public accommodations are public spaces are I think we you know I know that that. In all of our neighborhoods, perhaps someone thinks that this is our sidewalk. 
you know, and, and you're like, well, it may not be your sidewalk. I mean, my property line technically stops on just this side of the sidewalk. The sidewalk is a public space. So, but it gets to that point of, you know, can I tell someone to leave who's sitting in front of my house? Or even parked in front of my house, or is that, or or public accommodation, which again is a space. Are we a public accommodation in this building? Is is your house that's used as an Airbnb a public accommodation while it's being used as an Airbnb? I mean, there's just understanding the, that I think the size of those questions will be important um, as we try as we try to craft the language that's that gets to what you're asking for, which is as to be as simple. And, or to be as clear as possible. Well, clarity is always helpful. No one will argue with that. So we will. Because I don't think anybody wants to make, at least I would hope not, that people, it wouldn't be people that would want to make life for homeless people or severely disadvantaged people make it more difficult for them. But there is that gray shade which is, if you're a business owner, sticking to that particular, you know, but that they, at, at, what, at what point, do, if, at what point, if, if, if that is starting to interfere with your conducting business, sure. mm -hmm. at what point do you have the right to say, wait a minute, I'm not trying to do you harm, but, you know, yeah. Can I just jump in? I mean, we're using these hypotheticals with um, public spaces, eateries, and that access public. So since I check all those boxes, I think I can jump in real quick, being the restaurant owner in the group. So in a scenario like this, because I run into things of this nature, um, it's about, you know, at what point does like management feel like individuals maybe making others uncomfortable and or harassing a situation or blocking fire egress. So to speak to Ledger Council's point, they're so sort of like situational, it's hard to like nail it down. And you know, you can create this like laundry list of hypothetical situations. Right. Then they're all unique. So it's, you know, the question really is asking, it's like, a public space is a public space. I have no control over what happens on the sidewalk <coughs> establishment unless it's crossing a, a, a different boundary of legality. In the other part. Oh, mine was a hypothetical. It was, can I jump in for one second? I'm sorry. Yeah, the kids were coming in. No, no. Right? But I was saying, yeah, but because the then doors. with yours, I almost brought up that egress conversation, right? right? Because then that's actually, you're talking about fire commission, yeah. right? Can so that situation is totally valid. Well, man, I'm sorry to interrupt. Are there any legal questions for me? I complete my walkthrough. These are all good points, but they're more policy and more for you to discuss. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are there any legal questions for me about the bill? Um, I have one, sure. which I think is a legal question, if you don't okay. mind, Chair. Um, mm -hmm. Did I understand you to say that um, letter, uh, I'll give you page number, um, page four, line one, letter C, no person shall be subject to civil, civil or criminal sanctions for soliciting, sharing, accepting, or offering. Um, does that supersede, would that, if this became a law, supersede any laws that a municipality would already have on their books regarding that type of solicitation? Yes. It would? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. <clears throat> Ron, who do we have next? I'm, I don't have the thing in front. I don't have the agenda in front of me. I left it downstairs. We have uh, next. Sorry, working on this sheet. We have uh, in order. Uh, Julio followed by Paul. Great. So Julio, Thompson, please join us. Thank you. Julio, you you were here. You, you visited us last year, I believe. I testified brief, briefly, I think, on a prior version of the bill that did, did not include a Fair Employment Practices Act section. So if you can just reintroduce yourself to the committee, actually, we'll do a quick circle around just in case you don't know. Yeah, there are people I haven't met. Yeah, so, um, which means that you didn't spend quality time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, Representative Tom Stevens from Waterbury. Representative Matt Byron, Regens. Oh, you're not doing the laundry. Yeah, it's uh, uh, Friday. Right. 
Representative Lisa Hango from Berkshire, representing Richard Berkshire, Franklin. Yeah. Representative Mary Ann Dimash, representing Swanton and Shelton. Okay. I'm Kalai South Berkshire. Tommy Waltz, very city. Mary Howard, Rutland City. Jim Troy Allen, Standard. Okay. Uh, my name is Julia Thompson. <laughs> I'm an assistant attorney general and director of the attorney general's civil rights unit. Um, with respect to Vermont state law, we enforce Vermont's Fair Employment Practices Law for all employers except the state of Vermont, where it's the employer, Bor Yang is here, and the Human Rights Commission, which she, for which she's the executive director, she can talk about. Um, the other aspects of the bill that are addressed here, like housing and public accommodation additions, we don't have enforcement in all those areas. We also have enforcement uh, under Vermont's, um, the, our office has uh, concurrent criminal enforcement under the hate crimes law, um, as well as civil enforcement under the hate crimes law. I mentioned that because there was discussion earlier about actual or perceived. Uh, Vermont's hate crimes law does um, contain the phrase actual or perceived before listing protected categories that might provide enhancements for um, for hate crimes uh, offenses. Uh, the Fair Employment Practices Act does not include that phrase. And if there's questions about that, uh, about what our enforcement position is, where there isn't that language there, I'd be happy to talk about that. Um, so I'm just going to confine my remarks really to the, the fair employment practice areas. Um, so our office is, uh, I think we, we, we're supportive of this idea of including housing status as a protected category. I can't tell you as an empirical matter whether it would give us additional cases to enforce or not. That's really something we haven't examined. We don't really have much experience with individuals claiming that their housing status was a reason for being denied either employment or being treated uh, in an inferior way in, in the employment that they do have. As a practical matter, and I should also say it's the obvious, which is I'm not an expert uh, or policy expert on the problem of homelessness. I'm a state lawyer that enforces a lot dealing with employment discrimination. Our experience, though, in dealing with some of these issues relating to housing status, I just wanted to point out that there are several protected categories already covered by Vermont's Fair Employment Practices Act um, that, that I think may overlap to some extent with housing status. Uh, and in fact, adding housing status may make it, in some sense, easier to prove the already air already prohibited areas of discrimination. So um, individuals may be homeless for any number of reasons, uh, but some of them that relate to areas that we already, and the Human Rights Commission already um, protects would be individuals with physical or mental disabilities. Under the law, uh, disability is defined as an actual or perceived disability. That can be a physical or a mental disability. So it's conceivable that employers might perceive if they perceive one, someone to be homeless, they might perceive that person to be disabled. If they are treating the person, not hiring them, or treating them in an inferior way because they think the person's disabled, that's already illegal. Uh, and disability under state and federal law would include addiction or a history of addiction, a mental illness or a history of mental illness, and, and so forth. Another reason in our enforcement experience why individuals might be homeless temporarily might be because they're a member of the LGBTQ community. Um, these are young adults who might have come out to their families and are thrown out. Um, it's, it's unlawful, it's been unlawful for a long time to discriminate against uh, individuals because of their sexual orientation or gender identity. Um, but again, sometimes it may be hard to prove that that is the reason. Um, uh, but it is an area where we already offer um, protection. Uh, recently, the legislature added a new category of protection, which we supported, which was uh, crime victim status. That's another reason why people may be homeless, either on the short term or in the long term. Someone's the violence of, or the victim of violence, uh, and they are in a you know a shelter, trying to stay away from their abuser, trying to line up some other home. Uh, uh, housing situation, and sometimes that, that homelessness can be chronic. Uh, so Vermont law does, would prohibit an employer from discriminating against an individual because uh, that person uh, is, a, is a crime victim. 
Um, another area, and this one's a little hard, I, I, I just don't think the law has very good terminology for it, but another area of law that I think could be, um, uh, that may have a little bit of overlap with housing status discrimination is something called associational discrimination. Uh, it might it, it occurs in our experience in two ways. One is where someone is in a, a relationship with a person of a different race or color or nationality. So I may be white, but uh, my my significant other or my fiance or whatever it is a person of color. And uh, especially with younger people, they might be thrown out of the house because of that association. Um, or it may be um, differences about religious. So. I am, I am in a house where it's very strict on one um, uh, religious um, uh, or, or faith or combination of faiths, but I'm associating with people of a different faith. Um, religious discrimination has is, is long been unlawful in Vermont, as well under federal law. So, uh, but sometimes, again, it's hard to prove that. Um, all of these different protections. And so to some extent, housing may be, if an employer sees that a, an individual is homeless, what may be going on uh, is that they're viewing homelessness as a proxy for mental illness, addiction, <coughs> crime victim, so maybe a violent spouse is gonna come into the workplace. Maybe the person is, um, it, it may reinforce that the person is a member of the LGBT community. Um, so I think adding housing status, I'm not sure whether there are people who do not belong in those categories. I'm, I don't know how many additional individuals we would have coming to our office for protection um, because we have several areas of overlap. Um, but I do think that um, in some of those cases, you may have both going on. I regard it's your housing status, and I also think you must have a drug problem if you've been homeless this long or some kind of mental illness, disability. Um, so I think that, um, uh, I, I, I can't say it would be a great burden in our caseload. I'm not really sure what it would do uh, to our numbers, but it is, um, uh, it, it is an area that I think there is a lot of stigma for. Uh, and, and I think, I mean, we have some questions about how the law would apply in practice, and I'm gonna get to in a second, but some of the issues, uh, some of the questions that I heard earlier, um, I just wanted to briefly address because I think there were good questions and might require a, a bit of clarification and discussion, but um, not or with, with other witnesses. So for example, this issue about sleeping on the sidewalk, um, that is associated with homelessness, but not uniquely so. So last April, I and uh, our Solicitor General went down to Washington, D.C. to watch Vermont, represented in a case before the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, we got there early in the morning. We were representing the state, so we were guaranteed admission. But there were scores of law students and a number of law professors who were sleeping on the sidewalk for a day, day and a half, um, waiting for oral arguments. So people sleep on the sidewalk for any number of reasons unrelated to their housing status. They may be queuing up for, in that case, it was the Supreme Court. There are rules about where you can sleep. You can't sleep on the Supreme Court grounds. You can sleep on the sidewalk. Um, there are people who sleep in front of theaters to get tickets, uh, who may come from very wealthy backgrounds. Um, and so there are, I think there are, and I think Bohr can address this um, in the public accommodations context, but it's by no means uh, clear to me that a business couldn't clear its, you know, its exits and entrances for, for fire code purposes and so forth. Um, but, if they, but I think if you encountered a case where some people were the law students or they were perceived as being law students were allowed to sleep in front of, uh, of an entrance and people who were perceived as homeless were not, then I think that would, it would implicate that statute because it's not the sleeping on the sidewalk that might seem, would seem to be in play. It was something else, um, judgments about the person's income status or mental health or so forth. Um, uh, I think there are, um, there are some questions that we have about how this bill would, would apply. I think it's, it's clear that to us that clearly not hiring somebody or firing somebody or giving them inferior wages because of their housing status would clearly be unlawful. But there are other aspects of the Fair Employment Practices Act that come into play 
um, where something might be viewed as evidence of discrimination or even prohibited. To give you an example, let's talk about employment applications. So most employment applications ask for an address. Uh, now, it's not now employment applications don't ask people, as a general matter, what their religion is. Mm. Uh, and it's not per se unlawful uh, under Vermont law to ask for religion, although it can be quite strong evidence that there's an intent to discriminate. Um, I think the way we would read this law, if an employer continued to add for address um, information, because that's a traditional means of contacting individuals, find out if, they're, if the paycheck is not provided electronically, where to send the paycheck, and so forth. At least at first blush, we wouldn't consider that to be as suspect as asking about someone about like their HIV status or their or their religion or something else. Um, but if the legislature, you know, were inclined to say that we do have a problem with that, then I would recommend that the law be a little bit more explicit. There is a separate statute, a ban the box statute that the legislature passed that expressly prohibits at putting a criminal history question on a questionnaire. So as a matter of telling you how we would interpret the law, absent of that more specific prohibition, we wouldn't consider that to be necessarily uh, on its own as indicative uh, of a problem as it, as it would be like a religion or disability question. Uh, another question would be for us an application would be <clears throat> whether there is an whether the legislature intends there to be any sort of duty to accommodate the employee's homelessness in any way. Um, and this really this question really ar arises from our enforcement of the religious discrimination provisions. For many years, so decades, um, the prohibition against discriminating against someone on the basis of religion has been interpreted to include a pretty light duty, very light duty, I would say, by employers to accommodate that person's uh, religion in terms of scheduling and so forth, provided it doesn't, uh, the employer has a duty to accommodate unless it imposes more than a minimal burden on the employer. So you might have an employee who's a, um, say, uh, you know, belongs to religion um, that prohibits them from working on a, on a given day of the week. Under existing law, including Vermont law, uh, which follows the federal law, uh, if that employee asks not to work that day, the employer's duty would basically be limited to asking other employees to volunteer to, to switch shifts. But it would not be so, um, it's not so strict a burden that it would have to force employees um, to cover that shift. So it's considered a kind of an accommodation light. That stands in contrast to the disability law where if someone needs a reasonable accommodation for disability, employers, Vermont employers, long have had to provide the accommodation unless it produce, uh, imposes an undue hardship, which is a much more serious burden um, uh, to show. Um, for most of the other ca protected categories, like race and national origin, there's really nothing about that status that would require um, any form of accommodation, religious, because there are days and hours, perhaps, of religious observance. Um, that, that's one where courts have addressed that, and even though there's accommodates not in the statute with respect to religion, courts have said it's fairly implied. Um, and so the question for us would be whether there would be factual situations where an employee who is homeless would require some minimal accommodation by the employer um, to account for their status. And that could be a temporary one-time change in your reporting hours to work um, because maybe they have an interview for an apartment or they're, they're trying to get set up in an apartment. I think that we would, absent some, some language that's added to the statute, um, we, would, we would think that the case law would consistently require us to interpret that as meaning if there's some minimal uh, uh, accommodation that an employer would have to make um, that's not disruptive, that doesn't require, you know, that doesn't, basically would treat it on the same footing as um, the other sorts of accommodation typically associated with religion. We, I think we would, we would interpret that. If an employer had a case and they said, look, we can't do it for these reasons and they're more than minimal, minimally disruptive on the employer, um, then again, absent language to the contrary, we would, we would probably uh, say the employer's articulated a sufficient 
a sufficient burden. Um, but I mention that because it's it's not obvious just from having it in the statute. Um, like religious accommodation isn't isn't um, that that phrase is not in the statutes. But courts have courts have read the duty not to discriminate to encompass not just intentionally punishing someone, but failing to basically be slightly flexible to accommodate um, that status. So that's that's how I think we. Um, we would interpret that. Uh, the last question we would have in practice, just for something to think about, um, and I think this relates to the duty to accommodate, would be instances where the employer, there are, uh, the state of Vermont has a teleworking program, and so we could imagine cases where if someone is living in a shelter, a case where an employer may be less willing to allow that employee to take work home, like either proprietary materials or if they have a job where they have a, a laptop or something like that, um, absent some assurance of security. That would be that would be a question I think we uh, we would I think our enforcement position would be the employer would have to have more reason other than the fact that you resided at a shelter to believe that you couldn't do that. Um, again, I think that's related to accommodation, but that that may be something if you ask um, businesses about that, um, or, or advocates, or people who actually deal with trying to transition people back into the labor force about that. Um, because when I when I or you work inside your home, materials are generally secure a lot more secure than if they're just you know if you were living in, in a space where there are many other residents and you don't control. As an individual, you don't control their comings or goings. Um, so I just those are ones that um, that I would um, just lay out. Um, the final point I, I guess I would make, which is really in the area of wordsmithing here, but you know, last July the Department of Motor Vehicles adopted a non-binary designation for driver's licenses, so people who do not identify as male or female can choose X. And so I think that you know, in terms of the legislation here, where you could avoid the he or she and either rely upon the plural or avoid using the pronoun and all, would probably be viewed as, as more inclusive and consistent with state policy. Um, I think I've, I've been going on for a long time. Uh, I'll, I'll stop there and answer any questions or try to. So when you raise, when you say that there are questions to be raised, do they do they fit on the scale of objections or? Things that just need to be clarified, or things that need to just be looked at again, so that we're that we feel like there's a sufficient answer to them. I think when I'm not articulating them as objections to the law. I think the fact patterns that I've given you, I think might be predictable fact patterns, and I'm telling you or trying to tell you uh, how I think we would interpret the law as written. So because it's, it just says you can't discriminate because of religion, that includes a light duty to accommodate religion, um, you know, religion in terms of scheduling. And we would treat housing status in a similar way unless you think that there should be no duty to accommodate. If you think that there should be no duty to accommodate as a matter of policy, then I think you ought to say so because as an enforcement status, uh, an enforcement matter, I think we would treat it you know, on the same line, it's just by the way it's drafted in the statute. That's really what I'm saying. Sure, I mean, and that speaks to the fact that when we create law, we don't necessarily interpret it later. You know, that which not our response, it's, it's your responsibility, the court's responsibility to interpret it, and we see this all the time, where um, loopholes are found or interpretations of law are found that, that people are either being creative or they're actually interpreting it as it was written. and and. I'm not sure we'll ever be perfect in our law writing, but that's what you're, that's what an enforcement is. That's what a court is for. Um, but if we don't like that interpretation, then we clarify. Well, that, and in fact, I'm just giving you a dry run and telling you, like, if a, if an employee said I have to be 15 minutes late today because I have an interview to, to get my first apartment in five years, an employer says no, you're fired, you can't do that. We would probably take that case. We would view as implied a light duty. If the employer shows that those 15 minutes were somehow mission critical, maybe they could sustain their defense in our investigation. But my telling you that, or what our enforcement position is, is a way of giving you an opportunity if you don't think that that would be a, 
the right result or you wouldn't be comfortable with that result, this is a great time for the committee to address that. That's what I'm saying. Uh, on the issue of actual or perceived, I mentioned earlier it's kind of a bookmark that the hate crime statute includes actual or perceived race. Um, Fair Employment Practices Act uh, does not. Um, but our enforcement position is that we would we would take perceived as implied. Uh, I don't know that we would win in court because we haven't had a case that we've had to take. But it has come up in our office in this way, and, and it might be illustrative. For example, it would it has come up in other places in the country on the basis of religious um, discrimination. Um, John Eisenberg applies for a job, and the employer thinks John Eisenberg is Jewish, and in fact, John Eisenberg is not. Maybe a better example is Julio Thompson. Uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not Latino. I have a Spanish first name. Um, but uh, so if they say, well, we wouldn't want to hire Julio because we just don't think people who are, you know, are Latino or they're troublemakers or whatever, whatever the bias is that they that they articulate. Um, uh, I think our office would. I, I think our office would, or I would. I would want to take that case to say that you're basically judging me. I was denied an opportunity. It was the product of religious bias, even though I wasn't part of, or, or, or national origin bias in that example. Um, so we would take that. But there have been courts in other parts of the country that have taken different views. So there have been cases, for example, where someone who's a Sikh and wears a turban. Uh, isn't hired or it's, receives poor treatment because they were incorrectly viewed as Muslim. Uh, and some courts in different parts of the country have said, well, um, it, you're not Muslim, so you can't say you were being discriminated against because you're Muslim. I think our office's position, even though perceived isn't in the statute, we would still take that case. I can't say we would win it, because we haven't had it. And I don't think Vermont Supreme Court's addressed it. But, um, but I just wanted to state what our enforcement position would be. And if the committee wants to add it, I don't think it would change our enforcement at all. Um, I don't know. I can't say for Human Rights Commission. I'll leave it to that. But I, you know, she's right here. But so to clarify, it wouldn't change your enforcement position, but no. it, might, it might change your chance for success in court. Uh, it might. I don't know. I mean, like I said, it's it's an unknown to me because some we, I've read court opinions where courts say it's obvious answer A or answer B. You win or you lose. And, so, um, but um, yeah, it would certainly, it would take that, that argument away. That would, um, but in terms of a case, most of our cases, <laughs> virtually all of our cases don't end up in court. Uh, we do investigations. Usually if we find there's evidence or the employer knows that we found evidence, usually the case is resolved. So I don't know that it would actually, I mean, that's perhaps a reason why it hasn't come up. It hasn't come into play. Um, that's what I meant by not enforcing our our, our position, and, and I don't know that we've had an employer make that argument. They just they may disagree whether there was any discrimination at all. Any other questions? No. Okay. Right this minute. Thank you. All right. Thank you. That was quality time. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, Bo Yang, when you're ready. Thank you. And. Welcome back. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. How are we? Uh, I'm tired. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes. It's Friday afternoon. Yes. So uh, just for the record, Bo Yang, I am the executive director and um, legal counsel for the Vermont Human Rights Commission. And um, Julio just testified about the difference between our offices, but I thought I'd sort of brief you a little bit of, again about that if you'd like or yes, I want to be respectful of your time too so no, it's, I think it's important to understand what sure. and, and yeah. what slivers of, of enforcement and, and, and what cases you yeah be so thank you the Vermont Human Rights Commission has jurisdiction to enforce the laws that are being amended here including places of public accommodations housing and employment and as Julio mentioned we do all state government employment so anyone that works for the state who feels like they have been discriminated against 
uh, by their employer, their department or agency or whatever, they would come to us. Whereas Julio's office would do the civil rights unit at the AG's office would handle the private employers as well as municipalities and then so forth. Um, places of public accommodations is very broad, as Luke mentioned earlier. It does include uh, not just businesses and restaurants, but it also includes roads, and it also includes prisons. And so any place, and it would include the State House, any place that is open to the public, provides any sort of services or benefits to the public is a place of public accommodation. So. Um, any questions about the jurisdiction of the Human Rights Commission? Yeah, so our job is to investigate claims of discrimination in those three primary areas, and then we investigate those claims, we write a report, it goes to the commissioners. If we find that discrimination occurred, we try to settle it, then we litigate if we are unable to settle those cases. So generally, the Human Rights Commission supports H-492. It is a very good bill. And although I'm always hesitant to add more protected statuses, uh, because it could mean more work, selfishly, but it also means what does this do to the housing crisis in Vermont. And, but I do say that this is a very important protected status. Last year, we also supported adding victims of domestic uh, and sexual violence to the bill, I certainly, and we certainly support adding housing status to it. I would only recommend a few changes, and I also would like to talk, as Julio has talked about, application of the law, and then answer any questions that you have. So um, being that we will be applying this statute and these statutes, I think the first thing I would suggest is removing the reference to the federal law in terms of the definition of housing status. Generally, when lawyers are reading this, this suggests that the intent of the legislature is to have this statute be interpreted similarly to a federal law. And so if the federal law changes, that potentially, it raises the question, did you mean to have the definition be what it was at the time? Or do you mean to have the definition be what it is now? Or whatever court has interpreted 42 U.S.C. 11302, do you mean for our courts to interpret it the same way as federal courts? And I would say, that's don't do that. So you could borrow the same exact language that exists right now and just add it. But generally, I don't like referencing or I don't like when statutes reference to other statutes, particularly federal statutes that are subjected to change. So what you're saying is that is that if I committed, a, if, if X was illegal in 1999 mm -hmm. and I committed that crime, but it was uh, marijuana is a classic case. If I smoked marijuana in 1999, I was arrested and convicted for possession. Um, but in 2019, it's no longer illegal. Can I be convicted for that? If, Similarly, you know, you, I mean, yeah. Can I go back? I mean, do you apply the law that was in place at the time? Right. And is that what you're saying? Is, right, yes. So we're always, when a law is not clear and as clear as you, we would like, and as, as much as we would like to be perfectionists, I, I appreciated what you said earlier, too. The reality is, is that you have lawyers interpreting this years from now. And years from now, they might look at this and go, oh, 42 USC has changed. Do we follow what 42 USC was like in 2020? Or do we follow it what it is now? And depending on that definition, that could we, that could fall on the side of a respondent winning in a case or a complainant winning in a case, the plaintiff. And so, because it could open the door to what housing status it mean, homelessness means, it could also narrow the definition of homelessness. So, usually if you actually reference another state statute, it's probably okay because I would hope that when the committee that is charged with reviewing that statute, if they were ever interested in amending it, they would see that we have reference to those in other statutes. So 
Generally, I just say don't reference a federal statute. Actually, just borrow that language if you like that language and then include it here. And we did we did a, an abridged version of that in other definitions of, of what homelessness means. Okay. In the edu I mean, that's a testimony we took from the, the attorney that Great. in the education status, mm -hmm. it's it has similarities, but it's much abridged from what the federal status sure. is. Sure. Yeah. So uh, th that would be my first preference and hope that you would do that. The other thing that has come up, which is housing status being an actual or perceived, I absolutely recommend that you do include actual and perceived as language. Um, and it, for clarification purposes. And also because we know that in order to prove any kind of discrimination case, you have to prove that the adverse action, so whatever the adverse action is, kicking someone out or not hiring someone, whatever it may be, it has to be connected to the protected status. The law requires that it be because of the protected status. And most of the time, I think we wouldn't know what someone's housing status is, but we might be perceiving that someone is homeless without actually knowing that. And so it's gonna be really hard to prove housing status discrimination because most of the time the employer or the place of public accommodation or the landlord doesn't actually know this person is homeless, but they perceive them to be. So perception is actually, I think, what you intend here and we, need, we should include that. Um, so that's the second um, thing. Um, I, I appreciated what Julio said earlier about is there a duty to accommodate here and do you want to clarify that. I'm not sure I necessarily interpret the statute to include a duty to accommodate. There's no duty to accommodate race, national origin, mental health issues, disability, or anything else. So I'm not sure that I would necessarily include that. We specifically have here a duty to accommodate people with disabilities. And the statute sets forth that. And so unless the statute says that, that there's a duty to accommodate, I don't know if I would interpret it that way. And also, I think generally, we should be encouraging employers to accommodate employees regardless. So, you know, if they are 15 minutes late because they are looking for housing, generally we should kind of encourage that. Adding a no duty to accommodate, in fact, discourages employers potentially to accommodate where they really should. And so um, my suggestion would be not to include any language about accommodation in here. Um, also, um, I think that adding housing status as a protected category, while there may be overlap between mental health issues or disability or victims of domestic violence and um, housing status, it is another category that someone could prevail on. Um, and so that's important. So for example, when someone comes before the Human Rights Commission, they check and we check all the boxes that could potentially be a violation. Race, housing status, potentially, disability. We might find that there was no proof that discrimination occurred based on race, but there was proof that discrimination occurred based on housing status. So I do think having it as a separate uh, protected status is important, and I certainly would support it for that purposes. So having said all the things that I like, would you like to ask a question? Are you, are you at a punctuation point where John may cut in? Yes, sure, okay. absolutely. Uh, this is very clarifying. I really appreciate what you're telling us and I'm learning a lot, but I want to go back to this definition on the uh, line 15 on page one. The present time, many persons have been rendered homeless as a result of not hardship and shortage of safety and affordable housing. Mm -hmm. So is that, given that you talked about that people come in, there's multiple boxes people can check. Is, is, is that, the right definition for us to be using in this bill uh, from your perspective? So you're reading line 15. At present time, many persons have oh, been rendered. Page 16 and 17, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, so that isn't the definition of okay. housing. That is 
um, sort of what I think Luke mentioned earlier, oh, the fine, findings. Fine. Okay. Yes, the definition is found under that USC federal statute that you do right in here. And that was what I was suggesting should be just scratched and add in the actual language that you intend. And, um, I, and I apologize that I didn't read that federal statute. I want to make sure that we also include people who are transient. They might be at their sleeping on the couch, or they might be in a facility of some sort, but they are still homeless. And I don't know if that federal law includes that, but that, that, that's because I haven't read that federal law, so I apologize. Um, did you have a follow-up? No, that's great. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. All right, so in terms of application, I think the biggest concern that the um, Human Rights Commission has is not to public accommodations or unfair housing practices, but it is to employment, the employment sector, which is what really, what would be a legitimate non-discriminatory basis to defeat a discrimination claim here. And so the scenario that I could think of the address was really interesting too, but what if someone shows up for a, an interview and they look really, um, they look unprofessional or they look unkempt or they look like they might be homeless, okay? Right now, as employers, we could go, I don't like that. We shouldn't, by the way, but we, we might and it's still okay to not like the way someone is dressed but right now that's not unlawful, right? If you don't like an applicant because of the way they're dressed, that could constitute potentially discrimination based on housing status if you interpret the way they dress to be housing status, just it, it, that they're homeless. So, you know, could an employer defeat that kind of discrimination claim if they say, we just didn't like him because of the way he dressed? Let's say they admit that, okay? Sometimes they do. And they say, um, he smelled bad, he was unkempt, and he looked unprofessional, and generally we don't like that. Is that housing status discrimination? I don't know. I'm not sure. So um, we probably look into it. I don't know if we would end up finding that it is discrimination or not discrimination. And mind you, most of the time, they're not asking where do you live. That shows up in the application process with the address and so forth. Um, but during an interview, I could see that that could be, is it legitimate or is it not legitimate? It's kind of like um, the, the struggle that we have currently about mental health issues and psychiatric disabilities. When a psychiatric disability causes someone to behave a certain way in housing or places of public accommodations or in the employment arena, it, the root cause of the behavior problems is the mental health issue. But the employer says, um, I don't like your behavior. Is that discrimination because the root cause is mental health or psychiatric disability, or is it not? Is that a legitimate non-discriminatory reason? It's a very muddy area. It, it, it really is, and it's very hard. Having said that, just because it's muddy doesn't mean we don't go forward. I mean, I mean support it. I just want to uh, throw that out there. I certainly am happy to think more about that and maybe to even suggest potential language that might um, address that, but um, this is a new area, and so it does mean that despite our best intent, that it's going to be subject to lots of interpretation. Julio's office could interpret it completely different from the way we interpret it, and unless we go to court, and it, unless that court case goes all the way to the Supreme Court, uh, we don't know how a court would really even interpret it. And so we don't have that most of the time in Vermont. And so there, there is a gray area here, which is okay. Because sometimes gray areas actually help the people who are most vulnerable. And it allows us to engage in conversations about policy. And it allows us to have conversations about settlement and things that are helpful. So, yes. Wanted to be honest about all of those things, and and also answer any questions that you might have. I think there was a question earlier about could we could a restaurant owner tell people to leave, 
so that they could make room for other customers. Well, sure, unless they're telling them to leave because they're homeless. Or that's the because of. So yes, if you tell them to leave because of the homeless, the way if you tell someone to leave Starbucks because they're black, that's a problem, right? So if you tell someone to leave because they're homeless, that's a problem. But if you just tell them to leave the way you would tell anybody else to leave, because it's closing time, then that's okay. But in that scenario, you're actually telling homeless people to leave so you can make room for non-homeless people. And that's potentially problematic. And if a restaurant sees someone who's on camp and walks in the restaurant and the restaurant owner says, oh, you can't pay, you need to leave, that's discrimination. You don't know that that person can't pay. Right? There was a, a very, uh, um, there was a very, um, I don't want to say famous, but it was a, a case, a, a highly publicized case that came out about a Chinese restaurant that told a black man to leave because they, or they asked him to pay first. Right? Everyone else pays after they get the meal. They asked him to pay first because they didn't trust that he could. That's discrimination. So yes, if a restaurant owner sees someone coming in, and they're like, you have to leave, that's discrimination. And I think that's exactly what we need to, to support here, and, I, and that's okay. But any qu other questions? I well, I think there was a distinction. I just want to make sure I wasn't misunderstood. I wasn't, the chair mentioned this place of business. So the restaurant, if someone's coming in to partake of a meal at a restaurant, mm -hmm. that's but I was talking about if you're blocking uh, the church, oh, church sure. if you are blocking sure. the entrances of sure. the restaurant or the Flynn Theater or the mm -hmm. Roxy Theater or something. That's okay because you would be asking anybody else to, to mm -hmm. move out of the way, not to block. Mm -hmm. Your decision there is not based on housing status. Your Got decision it. there is access. Okay. And so that's completely non-discriminatory. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. I'll ask the question that I'm sure is on other people's minds too. In your example of a restaurant, um, yes, uh, asking somebody to pay first because you perceive that they can't afford to pay for the meal mm -hmm. is certainly discriminatory, especially if the person is a person of color or any other protected class. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, what about the um, asking people to? leave after they have had their meal or whatever they're having and they've sat there for hours and you as a restaurant owner would you mentioned close but not even close the business at that point it's just these people have been there for hours hmm. I would ask as a restaurant owner anybody you hmm. know do you want anything else how do you ask somebody to get up and leave. Uh, how uh, how do you, without, or is it okay? Without it being sure. discriminatory. Well, it, this is a really great scenario. In fact, we had a kind of similar case, but it involved disability. So it depends on the culture and the norms of that restaurant. So like we know that if I were in Paris right now, I could sit there after a cup of coffee for two to three hours. Nobody's asking me to leave. If the restaurant is very busy and people sign their checks and they're out of there and they ask everyone to leave as soon as the check is signed, that's non-discriminatory. If the restaurant is small and it's in a little town in Vermont and nobody is coming in and no one needs that table, and they're asking them to leave, we don't know quite yet whether it is because of the housing status. So it would depend. So we had a kind of similar case where it was a, a gentleman who actually had a psychiatric disability day that caused him to engage a lot with the owners and he talked a lot. And they asked him to leave after several hours of being there. But we did discover during the investigation that many people sit around for hours. They sit there and do their homework. It's not a busy place. They sit there and do other things. They use the Wi-Fi for free. And those owners never asked anybody else to leave. 
So they're just asking this person to leave because they don't like the way that he engages, meaning he, and he's not, uh, he's not uh, disturbing the peace. He just is talkative. But maybe he was disturbing, disturbing the, the no, maybe he was disturbing the operation of the employees that that's where it gets very sure. murky right and there's no language that you can put here that would necessarily address the case-by-case -case situation like that so what we would be looking at is what is the culture and norms of that restaurant and is there another individual outside of the protected class that you treat differently or the same right so we're looking to see do you ask other customers to leave too because if you think about it, they are asking other customers to leave as well after an hour, let's say, and that's their norm, then they're not doing it for any discriminatory purpose, and that's fine. But if they only are asking this person to leave, that seems like it could implicate discrimination. But you can't, there's nothing about this bill that would answer that question one way or the other. Not passing it or passing it doesn't change that necessarily. Yeah. Do you can did that answer your yeah. question? Um, I'd be happy I to clarify. I don't think you have an answer for, for my question. Thank you. Representative Kamash. Yes, I'm looking for this specific. It mentions solicitation mm -hmm. of food. No. That's in the um, Bill of Rights. I think it's page three, maybe. I might what guess. Page four, the top. Sorry. Um, soliciting for food, water, money, for other donations in public places. That, to me, sounds like the classic definition of panhandling. Okay. I don't know if it would be, but people tend to, who are engaged in their own business, who are in a public space for whatever their reason, generally don't like being approached. And so, what would then constitute discrimination against somebody who is solicited? If somebody is bothering me, mm -hmm. and I will, and I say to them, please move away from me, or worse than fact, is that discrimination? If, not necessarily, no. Um, but if you're only bothered because they look homeless. No, I said if they approach. This is different. Somebody who is soliciting is engaging. Whether that, whether that would be discrimination under the Public Accommodations Act? That's yeah, your question. This says no person yeah. who is soliciting. Mm -hmm. So that person has a right to solicit me or anybody else for the purpose of hoping to get food, money, water, or what have you. Mm -hmm. And if I brush them off, let's say, mm -hmm. that's discriminating against them? So for the statute here that says places of public accommodations, in order for there to be discrimination, the responding party has to be a place of public accommodation. You would be an individual, and so we wouldn't be investigating that claim because you say, hey, stay away from public me. places. Right, and that's the Bill of Rights. So, so the laws that we enforce are under public accommodations, housing, and in employment. So the purpose of the Bill of Rights is separate and different in terms of what we could enforce under the three st statutes that are before us. So if you as an individual says, get away from me, don't solicit me, that's not something we would enforce. So but it's if not a restaurant it's owner. All right, let's, yeah, so I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just, I just wanna kinda like 
bring us back to the fact that this is the introductory on this bill. The, this, these are questions that we're going to get to, and we can ask them again. I think when when I want to when we want to focus on spend some time focusing on some specific sections of the bill. So keep your questions in mind. I'm not trying to shut down the fact that there are questions. I just want to, it's Friday afternoon. I just want to like sort of bring us home now. Um, Julia, did you have a comment or did Bohr cover that, do you think? Um, I just wanted to expand on the point that she made about the Bill of Rights. So there have been many court decisions holding that laws that restrict panhandling uh, where you're asking people for money to be un is unconstitutional because the, where the laws are directed towards the content of what is said rather than the manner of asking. So cities may lawfully prohibit individuals from following or closing in on people or harassing them, uh, you know, following you through town, that sort of thing. It might be kind of quasi-stalking behavior. But where the restriction is based upon the content of the message, so if a person is persistently following you to tell you about their favorite political candidate, then that wouldn't be prohibited. But the person is persistently following you, but they're asking for money. Courts have, by and large, said that that's a content-based restriction on speech. So cities may protect members from the public from being, you know, they may have legitimate disturbance of the peace laws where the aim is to protect people, to avoid a public disturbance, to protect people's individual um, individual safety, because you're, regula you're, you're regulating the time, place, or manner of speech, but not the content of speech. That's, that's what I want to say. So you can't, you can't, there are laws that can say you can't ask people for money, but you could ask them for other things. That would, that would likely be viewed as unconstitutional restriction on the content of speech. I just need clarification because I can't go home for the weekend without knowing the answer to this. So Luke Martland said that this wording would supersede any municipal law and that people would not, people would be allowed to solicit even if the municipality had a law at one point in time on their books, if this became statute. So I'm confused. Well, are, you, are you asking of whether it's a law or whether it's a personal thing? No. Like if a I'm store a says no soliciting on it. No. And that applies to everybody. That's not what I'm asking. But you're asking so for the town of Jonesville that said, we, we as a town decided that we don't want people soliciting. Mm -hmm. They passed that law that there's a no soliciting, no panhandling, whatever you want to call it. They passed a law um, and then this becomes law. How does this affect that person who stands outside an establishment and asks for money or food or water or whatever they're asking So for. the first question I would have is that passing, and this is probably a general question, would they be passing a law or would they be passing an ordinance? I don't know the answer to that because I don't have any towns to my knowledge that have an ordinance or a law like this, so I don't know, I don't know, like if, if Burlington, they, they talked about having something on Church Street to try to prevent solicitation. Mm -hmm. And I don't know where they went with that, whether it became an ordinance or not. Or right, so, so again, okay, um, I think the basic answer to your question is that if there is a state law in place that is stronger than a local law, mm -hmm. in this case, I, in my interpretation is that the, the state law would take effect unless the state granted that exemption through either a charter process or through you know what have you I mean we do have we do have limitations towns have limitations on what laws they can put in force and they're run by their charters so whether this applies I mean this is this goes hand in hand with the conversation we had about minimum wage our minimum wage is more is more generous than the federal minimum wage so therefore that law is upheld. However, our laws versus time and a half are far more draconian than federal law. So federal law applies. 
So I think there's, I think that that's the, the, what you can walk away with is basically, while we do have to do more research on it, generally speaking, a state law would trump a, a, a local law when it comes to, to laws like this. My question is if it's an ordinance, an ordinance does not have the same effect as, it's a, lo it's, it's a little bit lower on the, the mm -hmm. scale. But nevertheless, it would be, it, ordinances have been found to be discriminatory or have been supported over time, but we can, we can delve into that deeper. Um, Earhart Monka is here as well, um, represents many different home, home housing type organizations. Did you have a comment to, from the peanut gallery or? Um, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I Short can. or full testimony? Yeah. yeah. I can, and I can also come in, you know, when you take up the bill again, but um, for the record, Earhart Monk of Modern Affordable Housing Coalition, we were one of the proponents of this bill two years ago. Um, you, and I'm not a lawyer, um, so disclaimer, uh, my understanding is that uh, ordinances that have been passed by uh, municipalities at the local level that prohibit panhandling generally are ruled unconstitutional, and one of our goals in this uh, is to prevent municipalities from having to get into, to provide some guidelines for municipalities uh, that might want to um, pass ordinances that ultimately are unconstitutional. And um, there's a history of municipalities having done that um, that wind up getting sued and losing. Um, so there, there's some effort here to provide some guidelines for municipalities as in Vermont law as to what they can and can't do. Um, so as to, in, in effect, um, help both vouchsafe the, the rights of, uh, of folks who are homeless, the rights to free speech, and panhandling has generally been considered uh, a form of free speech that's constitutionally protected, um, and so simultaneously uh, help guarantee some of those rights, uh, and also provide some guidelines for municipalities so they don't get themselves in trouble with uh, long and costly litigation. Thank you. I'd like to um, just end with why I think this bill is so important. I, all, I regret that I didn't talk about it earlier, but discrimination against people who are poor is a very real thing. And there are studies that have shown that we, when we see someone and we judge them as being poor, we think they're not as smart. We think they're not as competent as and capable, and that we feel very different feelings towards them. So someone who is asking for help that looks homeless, we treat them and feel very differently about them than if it was someone who doesn't look as poor. There, is, there was um, an experiment where they had a little girl who was acting. They dressed her up as being having money, and they dressed her up as poor, and she looked lost in a restaurant, in a place of public accommodations, and when she was dressed as poor, people were like, stay away from me, or, ign or ignoring her, even though she looked lost. When she looked rich, people said, hey, can I help you? What can I do for you? Can I call somebody for you? We feel very differently about people based on the way they look, if they look rich or they look poor. There was another, another study around implicit bias, where they asked the participants to judge whether a little girl by the name of Hannah was smart or not smart, and um, based on the fact that they knew some information about her, whether she received free and reduced lunch or whether she didn't. And they, most participants says, we can't judge whether someone's smart or not based on the fact that she is poor or rich. Then they had them watch a 10-minute video of Hannah answering questions and then they ask them, well, now that you've watched her for 10 minutes, is she, do you, can you now think you can evaluate whether she is smart or not? And the participants were then very comfortable evaluating whether she was smart or not. What they didn't realize is they were all watching the same video. And the only difference was that they were either primed with the fact that she was rich or that she was poor. And those who believed that she was rich watched the same video and said, she is smart. And those who watched the video and, and, and had been told that she was poor said, this is evidence that she's not smart. We, are, we do discriminate explicitly and implicitly against homeless people and people who are poor. This is why this bill is really good.
And, and to, to close, I think, on that note, or the, <clears throat> what we're saying in this bill is about behavior in the public sphere. This does not make a comment on someone's personal biases, except as how they act in public, how they may act in public. And that policies set by people who work in the public, the world of public accommodations, must provide a level field of acceptance under these conditions. But, but it's not it's not universal. It's not again. A, we can. There are still levels where people can be discriminated against legally. That's fine. But but you know, I'm, it's just brings it home that this is. This is about the public sphere. Yes. Again, if someone who acts this way or feels this way or believes this way for their own selves, this is no comment on that. Right. Except as they are, except as policies are promulgated in the public space. Correct. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, this is this is obviously this reminds me of a lot of the testimony that happened two years ago. It's not going to be um, an easy bill necessarily, and if we take it up, we will take it up further next week um, with further testimony, and we will always have balanced testimony before we make a decision on the bill.